prophetic word over this house of expanding territory is it's a year to get loud. And who better to lead us in stewarding this prophetic word than our friend Sean Foyt. Listen, Sean Foyt is a man amongst boys. When churches shut down left and right, abandoning God's word in fear of government pushback, Sean wasn't even pastoring a church. He said, I don't need to. We'll just go out and have church on bridges, in streets, in parks, downtown, on the beach. He didn't care. Listen, and when a world cowered in fear, Sean stood up and he led. Come on, can we give honor where honor is due? Can we let Sean Foyt know that Fort Worth, that Mercy Culture, that Waco, that DFW is behind him? Come on, celebrate Sean. Sean. It's quite the intro. Can I, uh, can you go with me everywhere? <laughs> Man, it's so good to be in Texas. It's so good to be in God's country. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing to be back here. Um, we love this church. We value you guys. We you know, as I was praying for this week, and, and before we do that, um, we, we've, we've been going about, we've gone to about 170 cities across America. This year, we really felt like we were supposed to be super intentional and go to 12. We picked out 12 that our team, we prayed over, that we were going to actually go and just bring everything that we got to these 12 cities, do a whole weekend of outreach, evangelism, um, feeding the poor, clothing people that need clothes, just an all-on assault of the kingdom of God on cities across America. One of those cities we picked was in Texas. No, it's not Dallas. We love it. No, it's not Houston. We love it. No, it's not San Antonio. But we really felt called to go to Austin. And so, <laughs> so I want you to watch this because I want you to join us in September. If you can just play the quick promo for what's going to happen this fall. All right. Who's going to join us in September? It is going to be wild. We're going to gather thousands of people in the capital city, and I feel like it's really, really significant. I feel like the battle for the soul of this state is in Austin, Texas. And so we need all y'all, don't stay comfortable up here in Fort Worth with your cowboy boots and your hats and your, you know, come down, let's rumble in Austin, let's bring the kingdom of God, it's going to be an amazing weekend. Second thing um, I want to say before I start is I have a, a book that's coming out um, in a, just, I think, a few months. It's been canceled twice. Two major publishers, two of the biggest publishers in America have canceled it. The second one we had actually a, a contract with. But you know what? It's kind of awesome, right? Because, I mean, if they are canceling this message, how much more does that prove that we need it? <laughs> so thankfully, Regnery picked it up. They're real excited about it. It's called Bold, Moving Forward in Faith, Not Fear. You can download it, uh, pre-order it. Please pre-order it. It'll help us get the word out. That's going to be coming out soon. Lastly, we started a movement called Parents Fight Back. I'm going to share a little bit more about this. Uh, I really believe, and I said this on Fox News, 2022 is the year of the parents in America. Mama bears, it's, it, they're, they're rising up. 
across America. We're seeing it in school board meetings, but really we're also seeing it against Disney. And so I'm going to share a little more about that. This is our graphic, Dis Needs to Stop. Pretty amazing. We got a lot of these clever signs, but go to Parents Fight Back. You can join. Please go there, parentsfightback.com. Sign the petition. Our goal is to have 100,000 signatures as we lead up to a giant event we're doing in front of Disney World in Orlando, Florida later next month. All right? All right, so go do that. It's going to be amazing. All right, so here we go. A little bit of context behind what I want to share because I really feel it's a doozy. And, you know, I love, I'm a very hopeful person. I'm a very optimistic person. But in the last week or two, I've been really sobered up with a conviction for where the church is sitting in America in 2022. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot. I've been to a lot of cities. I've been to blue states. I've been to red states. I've been to purple states. I've been to tough cities like Portland and Seattle. I've been to the cornfields of Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. I've been in rural. I've been in city. I've been in ghettos. I've, we have brought worship and revival and prayer to more places in the last two years than I know of another ministry. And yet I feel like my heart today is to share a perspective, a sobering word for where I feel like we're moving into right now in America and really release a clarion call. I uh, posted today an open letter to the church leaders of America that I posted online. You can read it. It's sharing a little bit of my heart behind. And here's the thing. I I love the church. I grew up in church. My parents are pastors. They're full-time medical missionaries. I was sharing about it in the first service. Man, I, I was like assemblies of God. We went three days a week to church. There wasn't a question about it. I was in Royal Rangers. Come on, anybody else out there? Royal Rangers, man. I knew how to make fires and quote scripture. Right? I, I, I grew up, I love church, but I am so compelled in this season You know, you only fight for the things that you love. You with me? You fight for the things that you love. We can see this modeled, uh, you know, in the story of Jesus as, you know, this is really, this is a sermon for Mother's Day, but he didn't want to turn the water into wine. His mom manipulated him to do that, okay? That's the Bible. Read it for yourself. It's a great Mother's Day sermon. He said, Mom, I'm not ready. She goes, oh, I'll tell you you're ready. You're going to do this right now. But when you look at Jesus, the initiation of his ministry was actually spent sitting on the side of the road, weaving a cord of whips. He waited 30 years to sit on the side of the road and weave a cord of whips, which takes about three to four hours, according to my research, so that he could go into the temple and wreck shop. That's how Jesus wanted to start his ministry. And I guarantee you, people were hurt in that process. But what compelled him and drove him to do that? It says that as he was in the middle of this thing, just whipping everywhere and going crazy in the temple, it says that the disciples looked upon him and they remembered Psalm 69, 9. Zeal for your house consumes me. They saw the embodiment of that promise in the book of Psalms that Jesus was was actually manifesting the reality of what zeal looks like, passion, love. And so I feel like today, like we need some leaders to rise up and clean house in America right now. And I'm probably the least qualified to do this, okay? I'm probably the least qualified to do this. I might be the youngest, I might not know enough, but I'm telling you, I cannot sit back any longer and see what's taking place in our nation, specifically among leaders, and not say anything. So I'm gonna say some stuff today. It is not our job to make the church look good to the world. I remember when, when we were doing this, when we were launching this Let Us Worship thing, I mean, it's, it's kind of ridiculous to think that worshiping God outdoors was controversial. I mean, how insane were we in 2020, right? 
Like, that's controversial. I mean, now we know it's like, whatever. But at the time, there was all of these leaders that were trying to get me to make these statements and I'll tell them what you really mean and all this stuff. And I had to actually go to politicians to get the best sounding advice for me in that season. The politicians told me, they said, Sean, never apologize for worshiping Jesus. Never do it. Never bow to the mob. Never try to over-explain yourself. And we're, in, we're caught in a season in America today where the politicians, not the church, are the ones leading the cultural wars. We've delegated our authority. And I, I like some of these guys. I mean, DeSantis, I like him. I like, I like some of the people fighting, but that should be the church. The church should be fighting against the sexualization of our children, not a governor. It never ends well in America when the church follows politicians. <laughs> Are you guys with me? Now they're the ones with boldness right now. They're the ones with courage. They're the ones calling out critical race theory. They're the ones calling out the transgender agenda. They're the ones calling things out. That should be us. We don't take our notes from politicians. We take our notes from Jesus. But yet we've abdicated so much territory. It says this in uh, Romans eleven twenty two. See the kindness, see then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, for otherwise you too will be cut off. We have fallen on the side of the kindness of God for so long, we forgot that his kindness is his severity. We know a lot about the love of God. We know little about the fear of God. Me and my wife was funny. We were, we were just talking about this as we were going to Good Friday service last week with my kids. And, and I, was, I was thinking, when is the last time like I heard a sermon about sin? And then we looked at each other and we're like, do our kids even know about sin? <laughs> like, this is real, real talk, right? We're driving in the car and, and of course my kids know they're sinners. They know that. But do they know the consequences of sin? So we're just in the car and I'm just like going for it. Guys, shut off the DVD player, listen to me. Jesus took all of our sin. The wages of your sin was death. And I'm like preaching in the car. My wife's like, babe, just chill a minute, okay? I'm like, no, they got to understand. They got to understand the consequences of sin. I grew up as a kid going to, you know, going to these, these, you know, these weekends, these revival weekends or going to, you know, church camp. I ran down every altar call. I was like, I'm not going to hell. I'm running down every altar call. I came down to every single stinking altar call. I got saved 12 times in a weekend. <laughs> Anybody else with me? Right? And I'm not saying we use fear as a scare tactic or hell's a scare tactic, but I'm saying there's a whole generation that doesn't even know what sin is. They don't even know what hell is. They don't know about the severity of God. I want to read some data to you. I was up late last night doing a deep dive into the, the data surrounding Generation Z. First of all, I wanna identify some groups in the room. Let's start with baby boomers. Raise your hand if you're 1946 to 1964. Come on, boomers, where, where are my boomers at? Holla. All right, 1965 to 1983. If you were born in those years, that's Gen X. We got some Xers out there. If you were born between 1984 and 1998, you are a millennial. Raise your hand. <laughs> 1999 to 2015, Gen Z. Come on, where's Gen Z at? Where's Gen Z at? Come on, lift your hands. Yeah, I knew there would be more in this service. Y'all were sleeping. First one. Generation Z, let's talk about Gen Z. They are the youngest, most ethnically diverse, and largest generation in American history. They compromise 27% of the U.S. population. Pew Research recently defined Gen Z as anyone born after 1996. 
Some people say 99, some say 96. Gen Z grew up with technology, the internet, social media, which sometimes causes them to be stereotyped as tech-addicted, antisocial, or social justice warriors. They are the most educated generation in history. They have the most access to information of any generation in history, right here. They are the most likely to believe that the government should solve all of our problems. This is true, this is a recent survey. Seven in 10 Gen Zers say that the government, not individuals or businesses, should solve the issues. They are the most depressed in history. They are the most addicted to drugs in history. They are the most confused about their gender in history. This is one I wanna add. They are the most hungry for Jesus in US history. And I can share this because we've traveled across America and every altar call we do is primarily Generation Z. They wanna get free. They wanna find God. They want something that's authentic. Barna Research just came out with a study. You guys may have seen this. It was posted by several outlets. You can throw it up there from Newsweek. They, they reposted it, but Barna Research says this, 30 to 40% of Gen Z and millennials identify as LGBTQ. 30% of young Christians. Y'all hearing me? 30% of young Christians identifying as LGBTQ. Without a revelation, the people cast off restraint. Proverbs says this. They're searching for the, their identity. They don't know who they are. They're confused. I wonder why. Well, maybe the schools have something to do with that. I wonder why. Maybe Disney has something to do with that. I wonder why. Maybe the stuff that they're addicted to has something to do with that. They've been looking in here for answers. They've been looking in here for answers. They need to look up here for answers. Without a revelation, the people cast off restraint. I am raising the alarm right now at Mercy Culture Church this Sunday and saying, we are in a crisis in America. We are in a crisis for the soul of the next generation. I have four kids, four Gen Zer kids that look at me every day, ages 11, nine, seven, and four. And the other day we were at the beach and I gotta be honest with you. I was at, we were at the beach, we were, we're down in SoCal and I was looking at my kids playing and I'm just thinking to myself, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm, I'm a very hopeful, joyful person. A lot of you guys know that, super joyful. I march in front of ISIS with guitars. We go in front of Antifa and Satanists with worship. I laugh at them, I think it's funny. I love to see God show up and do only things he can do. But I do have moments where I'm like, what? is happening to this earth. And so I'm sitting there at the beach, the kids are playing, and I'm just looking at my kids and I'm going, God, like a serious moment, I'm going, God, I don't know. How are they gonna survive this world? We got a Supreme Court justice that can't even define what a woman is. Don't go there. Yeah, I'm going there. That's crazy. They're supposed to be smartest people in America. They can't even define what a woman is. The church is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not okay with that. And I'm sitting there looking at my kids and I'm just like, God, how are they gonna do this? And I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me. He said, Sean, I've given them everything they need to absolutely crush it in this world. Like they were born, I made them for such a time as this. I created them for such a time as this. And then I look at my four-year-old and he's crazy, man. He's like, he's on another level. And then I, I'm reminded, okay, yeah, I think they can do this. You know, as he's, as he's walking through the streets of California going, boycott Disney. <laughs> That's my kids, you know. I wanna give you some tools today. I wanna to give you some tools to how to navigate this season and then we're gonna pray for boldness at the end today and I wanna pray every single one of you get so fired up with boldness 
that today's a turning point for your life as we go forward. Number one, unfriend the world. Couple claps out of that. Unfriend the world. We care too much what people think. Wokeness has become a cancer in the body of Christ that's handicapped us from saying the truth of what needs to be said. We're worried about being canceled. We're worried about being censored. We're worried about people not understanding. We're worried that we might have to over explain things. Listen, it's not your job to make sure the world understands the church. It's not your job to make sure that God looks good as if he needs your help to look good. It's so funny, I hear that from millennials where you're just gonna make, evangel- you're just gonna make the church look bad. Well, that's not really my job to make the church look good. Especially not good according to what you think. We care so much about what people think. We are not accountable to the world's opinions. Now I hear y'all have been having some articles written and not, trust me, I've had a lot of articles written. Who gives a rip what the Fort Worth Star Telegram says? As if that's your report card of what, how you're doing in the kingdom. As if God's reading the star telegram or whatever it is, some weird paper looking at it saying, I don't know, they, they, they're not saying good things about mercy culture. Give me a break. It's not your job to try to explain yourself to them, to make sure these crazy leftist reporters understand the kingdom of God. That's not your role. Keep doing what he's called you to do. Be free from the fear of man. Be free from the opinions of the world. Well, that's just a little harsh, Sean. That's just a little intense. Unfriend the world? Are you sure? Unfriend? I thought we were supposed to be friends with everyone. James 4.4 says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That's pretty intense. You know, one of the things that I'm thankful for, and it's been a difficult process, is there's been so much exposing that's happened in this COVID season. And that's really the kindness of God in the American church. Like, we're the ones that should say, God, search me and try me. Let everything that's been hidden be revealed. And in America, you had a whole bunch of church leaders and pastors that our role in 2020, this was time to fight. And instead, in the year when kings go off to war, David was at his house. Looking at Bathsheba. In the year when kings go off to war, know the season that you're living in. Be a people that understand the times and the seasons. This is a season to fight. This is a season to rise up. This is a season for salvation, for souls, for signs and wonders, for miracles. It's wild to me, like, the trans movement that people are trying to befriend or be an ally to or all this, The trans movement has an agenda. Did you know that 50% of males in the trans movement have committed suicide? That's the current trend right now. One in three people identified in that movement tried to kill themselves last year. It's a movement, it's a cult of death and perversion and destruction. And if the church in America doesn't start standing up and talking about this, Come on, somebody. Yes, we love these people. We see, I can't tell you guys the amount of people that we've seen saved and set free because every city we go into, we we feel a call of God to give an altar call for those battling with same-sex attraction. Every single city we go into. And the first time we did it, I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. But now it's just easy. People run down to the altar. They get freed. They get saved. They get delivered. I was in San Marcos, California a couple months ago, and we gave this altar call, and this woman starts running down. She's in the middle of hormone therapy. She runs down. Right as she's running down to the altar, true story, she's running down to the altar, a rainbow lights up the sky behind us. 
You can't make this stuff up. And we start hugging her and she's in the middle of, of this hormone therapy and we, we start calling out that she's a daughter of God and he loves her and he gave his life for her and she's made in the image of God and we start speaking life into her. She starts weeping and crying and you can feel this daughter of the king, this heart of the daughter of the king. That's what the church needs to be doing. We don't align ourselves with perverted, demonic movements. We bring freedom to them. Number two, hold the line. Someone say, hold the line. Now this, <laughs> I had a great hold the line moment when I was at Mercy Culture last year. And this is when I knew that y'all were some gangsters here. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. They were like, Landon and, and Pastor Landon and Heather were like, we're gonna do this justice run. And, and I was like, that's cool. Like, I don't, I don't f feel the grace to run, but told my wife about it. And she's like, oh, I've always wanted to do that. And I was like, great, okay. So now she's gonna be running hours every day training. And she did, and it was awesome. And I supported her and I was with her. So we showed up here and all of a sudden we're, we, we realized that they just so happened to plan this justice run during like the craziest weather that's ever come to Texas. And there's like tornadoes that are forecasted, there's lightning strike, there's storms. And I, I kept asking them like, yeah, it looks kind of crazy. Uh, the weather uh, today looks kind of crazy. And Landon's like, yeah, we're still doing it. This is a justice run. We're not, we're not stopping nothing. And so I was like, okay, bro. So we show up there, how many of y'all were there? We show up in Fort Worth, literally, I'm, I'm like, I'm sitting there and it's like this eerie, have you seen the movie Twister? It's like super quiet and eerie because it's like kind of quiet, but you look over there and it's like pitch black clouds. Like Leviathan is coming. And we're sitting here and they're, they're doing music and Jasmine and them are up there and it sounds so pretty. And the cops are kind of flurrying around because they, they know what's up and they're pulling the radar out. And they're like, I don't know. And so I remember going to him, I'm like, I don't, I, what do you think is gonna happen? He's like, oh, we're gonna run. This is justice run, we're gonna run. It's like, all right. So my wife is running and this is like, literally that black cloud is getting a lot closer. Kids are running everywhere. Parents are trying to find kids. Some people are trying to eat their corn dog and wait for the people to come through the line. I don't even know. I had to end up leaving because it got so gnarly, the weather did, and I just was praying over Landon. I'm like, he might get like taken up like Elijah. <laughs> you know? But that was when I knew, when I saw how gritty y'all were about a run for justice, I was like, oh, this church, they know how to hold the line. Hold the line. We got to hold the line in this season. Hebrews 10, 23, read this with me. Hebrews 10, 23, I just got a couple more points and then we're going to pray. Hebrews 10, 23 says, throw it up on the screen for me. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. That means you're not wavering. This is not a season to waver. Let us hope unswervingly let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Go down to the next line. And let us consider how many ways spur one another on towards love and good deeds. How do we spur one another on? I'm glad you asked. We do it by not giving up meeting together. Now listen, all you online church people, I love online church. I think it's amazing. I'm grateful for technology but watching a screen is not a replacement for being in person. And a lot of you guys are in, you're, in, you're watching, but you're in, you're, you're in a home group and stuff, and that's legit, I love that. But I'm telling you, we, like, I don't know where this mentality came in America, where these pastors that said, oh, if you really love God and you really love your neighbor, you're gonna sit at home by yourself watching a screen because you really love your neighbor. And I'm like, no, no, you really love your neighbor when you go out in the middle of sickness, which is 99.8%, whatever. You go out in the middle of sickness and bring healing. You go out in the middle of people on, on the edge of suicide and bring hope. You go out in the middle of rioting and burning and looting in America and you bring reconciliation. 
And it comes later to find out, and this study just was just released, you can look up the article, a lot of these big churches, some of them were in California, were actually getting government funds to keep shut down so that they could promote the vaccine. It's gnarly, man. They were some of the biggest enemies against us. I'm like, this is what we learned our whole life. We didn't learn to run from darkness. We don't hide in our room when there's, when there's a, a plague. We're the ones that carry healing. We're the ones that carry breakthrough. We're the ones that carry hope. We're the ones that carry deliverance. Not give up meeting together. I'm telling you, something is going to happen in America. There is going to be a shift right now. I think it's like every, people go to church like once every month or twice every month. Even good Texas people. We got to quit that, man. We need, some, we need some stability, some sustainability, some consistency in our life. Y'all need some discipline in your life. I grew up with Assemblies of God, like I mentioned. It wasn't like Super Bowl's on. Oh, who cares? We're going to church. My parents, man, they didn't play. A generation is crying out for discipleship and consistency. Do not give up meeting together. And it says even more as you see the day approaching. All right, Nehemiah 4.14, I wanna read this. So hold the line. You talk about holding the line and why we're holding the line. And I, wanna, I really wanna end with this clip from Disney with my daughter. It's, it's a powerful moment. But in Nehemiah, we, of course, you, you have them, they're rebuilding the wall. And you have this statement, and I love this. It says, Verse 14, it says, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Fight for your families, your sons and daughters, your wives and your homes. So in the midst of this struggle, Nehemiah, he's reminding them who you're fighting for. Listen, if you don't know who to fight for, let me give you some reminders. One of the largest corporations in America of entertainment came out with leaked audio and leaked videos saying, we are purposely targeting your children with LGBTQ characters. We're purposely grooming them. We want all of them to see this stuff and we don't give a rip. Do y'all see that? You know what? In the 80s and 90s, in the moral majority of the 80s or in the 90s with focus on the family, it would have been over. James Dobson would have sent out an email and it would have been like, bam, shut Disney down. And Disney would have been like, we're sorry, we're sorry. Now, they don't care. Now we gotta wait for the governor of Florida to do something. Now we gotta wait for politicians to lead the way. The church should be leading the way the entire time. Assembly Bill 223, 2223, right now in California, I think it's sitting on the governor's desk. You know what this bill is? It's the infanticide bill. This bill allows the killing of babies up until 28 days after they're born. Are y'all listening to me? I like, I, I, you literally need to hear this. This is in America. There is a bill sitting on the governor's desk. It passed the Senate, it passed the House. Bill 2223, look it up, the infanticide bill. It allows the killing of babies up until 28 days after they are born. And you know what I hear from the church? Crickets. This is child sacrifice, man. This is demonic. And you know what? You say, well, I'm in Texas. I don't care. Let me tell you something. So goes California. So goes the nation. You don't believe me? Look at no-fault divorce under Reagan. Look at gay marriage under Gavin, the mayor of San Francisco. So goes California. So goes the nation. And y'all got a lot of California right here in Texas. Guys, how are we not raging on this issue right now? How are we, how are our hearts not totally, you know why? Because we're just numb. We're so numb, we're so detached. Maybe it's hopelessness, maybe it's discouragement, maybe we just, I don't know. 
what can we do? Let's just go on to church as normal. Listen, these are not the days for church as normal. Amos 9 says, let justice roll. Remember why we're fighting. Number three, I got two more points. Don't run from polarization. Embrace it. It's funny. In America, we grew up in a gospel where we weren't really persecuted. We weren't really ostracized. So we don't really like it. Like, we, we just kind of like, eh. When I go overseas and I spent so much time in the underground church, they just kind of expect it. They're just like born into it. If you're a Muslim and you're following Jesus in Saudi Arabia and you commit to Jesus, you're leaving everything. Your family, your jobs, everything you've known. It's cancel culture like you've never seen. We cannot be afraid of the polarization. People ask me all the time, Sean, is the world getting darker or is it getting, bri- or, or is it getting brighter? And I say, it's, it's actually both. Darkness covers the face of the earth, but the glory of the Lord arises on you. There is no gray area in America anymore. There's no gray area. Well, we just want to ride the fence. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. There is no more gray area. It's either hot or cold. It's either light or darkness. I mean, the celebration of murdering babies, the celebration is so demonic. The screaming that happened in the chamber the other day when they released the law, hamstringing Disney, the shrieking of demons. I mean, do you see it? It's like not hidden anymore. On this rock, I'll build my ecclesia, not my cool, relevant church. On this rock, I'm just gonna build like a really cool church. People are gonna think it's so cool. We're gonna have skinny jeans and we're just gonna be so sweet. People are gonna feel so welcome and they're gonna feel like, ah, oh, on this rock, I'm giving my life to the coolest Christian club. No, on this rock, I will build my ecclesia, the ruling body government. The gates of hell shall not prevail. If you want to be in the ecclesia, if you want everyone to love you, then go sell ice cream. That's your gig, man. If you want people to like you, go sell ice cream. If you want to follow Jesus, get ready. In 2022, if you want to follow Jesus, you are going to be a polarizing force for the kingdom. You are a walking contradiction. Everywhere you step, everywhere you walk, you are bringing light into darkness, hope into hopelessness, freedom to those that are captive. You are kind of a big deal. And I'm so grateful for this church and churches like this across America where we are literally, the goal isn't about how many we can gather. The goal is about how many we can send. I love that this church is having people run for school board and running for state senate and running for state congress. It's like we gotta stop advocating those roles to worldly people. Why shouldn't we be the ones leading the way in all spheres of society? Actually, if you're running in any of those offices, I just want you to stand. If you're running in any, come on, let's just give it up for these guys. Come on, give it up. Give it up, come on. And we pray for a hundred more. We pray for a hundred more. We pray, Lord, that you would raise up leaders from Fort Worth to influence every part of society. There is an embracing in this season, like, and and I just, I wanna be really clear on this and then I'll share the last thing.
really the whole let us worship movement was all built on controversy. Just being honest, we weren't trying to be controversial. But something would show up on CNN or something would show up in New York Times or some, somebody would go on today's show and they would rail on us. These people are gathering with no masks on. This is a super spreader. They would send helicopters from LA. They would swoop down and they would stay there. Watching. And guess what? Things just grew. <laughs> they promoted it for us. Sometimes God will turn the enemy on his head where he'll cause attention, people will come, they will come towards you wanting to persecute you, wanting to come against you, and they'll get saved and set free and delivered in the process. I remember we were in Chicago. One of my favorite examples, I have so many of this, but we were in Chicago, and we were there in South Chicago, and, you know, these guys showed up, this whole group of, you know, protesters they were mostly white and they were out there and they were just raging and you're you're displacing the pain of african americans in the city and you don't care they didn't realize like literally everybody preaching that day was a black pastor from chicago <laughs> so they were in us for a surprise when pastor after pastor got up there and they were like i'm sick of crime in our city we need a move of god i'm sick of the politics in this city we need jesus to show up and one by one these pastors started lining up they were preaching at these angry white protesters and all of the protesters ended up at the altar getting delivered and saved and set free I would even go, go as far to say this, let God use the controversy for his glory. You notice at the height of the controversy around Jesus, he didn't even say anything. They were like, give us your statement. He's like, no. Well, what do you really mean? No. Well, why did you do what you do? Nah. Be free, man. Be free, mercy culture. Break out of the spirit of fear. You sing about it all the time. This is who you guys are. Verse four, or point number four, make some noise. This is the hour to make noise across the world. Well, I don't know. We're just, we're just gonna be the church. We're just gonna be quiet. We're just, yeah, that's, that's done real well for us. Yeah, that's worked out real well as the, as the forces of hell are raging to take out our kids as the powers and principalities. And I, I, this is what I'm really sick of. I'm sick of allowing people that are not Holy Ghost, that are not spirit-filled on the front lines of leading the, 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 the battle to fight for our kids, to fight for education, to fight in government. I don't want secular people doing what the church is supposed to do. We have the answers. And we know the one who has all the answers, amen? Make some noise. Judges 7, 2 Chronicles 20. But I want to talk about Acts 4. I want you guys to all stand. Actually, no, no, don't stand yet. I want to show you a little video and then a stand. Acts chapter 4. Get that video ready of my daughter in front of Disney. Acts 4 says this. <laughs> John and Peter were so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Here they are. They keep getting in trouble. Like over and over. And like all of Acts is just them getting in trouble. <laughs> it's like 2020. It's like they're just in trouble all the time. Right? They're in trouble, but yet they're seeing the wildest manifestations of God's kingdom. And it says in verse 16, what are we going to do with these men? This is the government. What are we going to do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. <sighs> but to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no further to anyone in his name. 
Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Listen, I am so tired of pastors apologizing. Pastors and leaders, quit apologizing to the woke media. Preach the Bible unapologetically. Peter and John didn't offer any apologies. (laughs) They said, hey, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Too bad, so sad, we can't shut up, try and stop us. <laughs> and then Acts chapter five, they get in trouble, they get warned, we're gonna silence you, we're gonna da 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 And so they go together, they have a prayer meeting in Acts five. In the prayer meeting, they pray that they would get more bold so they could get in more trouble. <laughs> They don't go into like sabbatical or hiding season. Let's just go into a rest season because everybody knows we just need to hide. No, 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 they go, hey God, give us more boldness so that can happen again. I wanna show you this quick clip. It's a minute long of of me and my daughter. This has been seen, I think, 400,000 times now on social media across America. This is my 11-year-old praying in front of Disney two weeks ago, Katura. If you can play that and then we'll, we'll pray. We're gonna go back into worship, but I wanna have my daughter come up and pray. This is Katura. She's the reason why I'm here. And, and when, I, when I became a father, that day that I became a father, she's 11 years old, 11 years ago. And I held her in my arms for the first time. I knew my life was more about her destiny than about my own. I don't care, man. New York Times shredded me today. All those guys, they could shred me. I don't give a rip. I'm living for the next generation. They can say whatever the heck they want to say. They can call us white nationalists. They can call us racist. They can call us homophobic. They can call us whatever. They do all that stuff, and they're going to keep doing all that stuff. But they're never going to get me to stop fighting for my kids. Nothing is going to get me to stop fighting for my kids. And I really feel, even as Tura prays, I just wanted to pray, because I believe that this generation has been one of the most assaulted, maybe in human history. They're, they're dealing with stuff that we didn't have to deal with in the 80s and 90s. They're dealing with crazy amounts of propaganda. They're dealing with crazy amounts of, of, of indoctrination in the schools and, and TV. It's subtle, and a lot of it, we don't even realize that it's happening, but it's happening because this generation is the one that's going to bring revival to the earth. This generation is the one that's going to crush the head of the serpent. That's why the enemy is coming after them with such fury. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for love and joy to come over everyone. I pray that the, di- that the creators of Disney will open their eyes to see the truth. And I pray that they will experience the love of Jesus. They will not do any more bad movies. And I pray that my generation will see, will be in Christ, not in TV, not in any bad Yeah, bad stories, and I pray that they'll know to let kids be kids, because I don't want my generation to grow up in bad TV shows or to see bad things that we shouldn't see. I want it to be in the Bible and the truth. In Jesus' name, I declare it. Amen. 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 Why don't you guys stand up? Listen, I want to (laughs) pray. You know that all the Devils in hell were like, oh no, the 11 year old is about to pray. No, don't give her the microphone. I'm telling you, there is a calling on a generation. And this is what I wanna do. I want, I, I feel like tonight, today we're, we're called to make some noise. We're gonna do something super crazy and charismatic and weird and wild. Cause that's what these times call for, okay? So I want you guys to come down here. Come on, all of you, come down here. Especially you Gen Zers. I need y'all at the front. I need the Gen Zers at the front. 
and we're gonna release a shout. And listen, this is actually really biblical. They did it in Judges chapter seven with Gideon. They did it in Second Chronicles 20 with Jehoshaphat. They did it in Acts chapter four when they wouldn't stop preaching and they wouldn't stop worshiping. There is a sound that is coming to the church of America. It is a roar of boldness. It is a roar of courage. It is a roar of hope. It is a roar of no more on our watch. We're taking a stand. We're holding the line. We're speaking up. We are going to engage. And I just want to even pray before we do this. I feel like it's a time for sobriety, but it's also a time for us to be filled with God's hope. Because I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. And here's the cool thing. Nobody's going to be able to take credit. Not a church movement, not a brand, not a denomination. No one is going to be able to take credit for what God is about to do in this nation. We need supernatural intervention. Come on, you guys with me? Are y'all ready? Come on, scoot up here a little bit more. Come on, make a little bit more room. So what we're gonna do, is gonna release a shout over a generation. We're gonna release a shout over America. This is a shout to wake up. Come on, turn to someone, say wake up. This is a shout for us to come alive. This is a shout for us to remember who we are. We are the army of God. Come on, tell someone, you're the army of God. So on the count of three, come on, here we go. We're gonna lift a shout. This is not a Dallas Cowboys shout. This is not a Dallas Maverick shout. This is a shout for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords over the nation. Come on, on the count of three, here we go. America to see this. Now, I brought this with me. How many guys know what this shirt is? In the 1960s, there was a movement called the Jesus People Movement. It started in California. On the beaches of California, hippies started to get saved. Marxists started to get freed and find Jesus. People that wanted a revolution in violence began to give their life to God. Drug addicts began saved. Homosexuals began to get freed. It was happening all over the West Coast. But it didn't, it didn't actually get credibility until they showed up in the Cotton Bowl in Texas in 1972. I'm giving you some Texas history. Billy Graham showed up at the Cotton Bowl with a bunch of these wild hippies. And he stood up there on stage and he said, this is a legit move of God. This is revival. The next week, a guy wearing this shirt was on the cover of Time Magazine. One Way Jesus. This is from the Cotton Bowl in North Texas. That magazine went like wildfire throughout the earth that talked about a Jesus revolution. I'm here from California, where a movement was birthed in San Francisco at the height of the pandemic. And I'm in Fort Worth, Texas, telling you it's time for another move of God in America. Come on, are you with me? Come on, we're gonna give a shout for revival. We're gonna give a shout for revival. We're gonna give a shout for revival. Here we go. Come on, we're gonna give a shout for revival. 